Praise the Lord. Great to see you all here. Welcome to those live on TV and uh, YouTube around the world and uh, those that couldn't be here today. I know that I couldn't be here last week and it was great just to be able to tune in and see the back of all your heads. It was great. <laughs> right. Let's just pray, shall we? Father God, we are just um, so blessed to be here this morning and um, when we come together, it, it's a privilege, Lord, because sometimes we can't come together and uh, in these days of uncertainty, Lord, that we can come together and worship you together is such a blessing. Um, so we just reach out to those that are sick this morning that couldn't be here um, and for other reasons, Lord, that you would just bless them in their homes as they watch. Pray, Lord, that your spirit would touch them as, as you move here with us. Um, just fill us this morning, Lord, as we reach out to you, speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, and um, let us just worship together in unity in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've got a uh, call to worship this morning. is from Psalm 24. It says, Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Amen. Right. I'll hand it over to Lindley. Okay. Um, stand and let's, let's open. Let's welcome God here this morning. Welcome his Holy Spirit's presence and um, enjoy communion with him in the spirit. Let our praise be a welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. We welcome you with praise. 
we welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this praise. Let every heart adore, let every soul rejoice. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this praise. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. Mary and Martha were two of Jesus' good friends. They were getting ready for a big dinner party at their house. It was dinner for Jesus. They had invited all his good friends. Now, if we had Jesus coming to your place for dinner, what would you have? Fish and chips? Pizza? McDonald's. McDonald's. Everybody's going to the Job's place. <laughs> right. That night, many people sat down together. At, actually, that's really good because we'll talk about that later if I remember. That night, many people sat down together at Mary and Martha's table. Martha was busy as always. She carried the food to the table. She was busy. But Mary did a surprising thing. She took some perfume that cost a lot of money and she poured it on Jesus' feet, and she wiped his feet with her hair. Mmm, it made the whole house smell sweet. One of Jesus' friends was named Judas. He said, why didn't Mary sell this perfume, and she could have given us the money, and then we could have given it to the poor people. But Judas said this because really he wanted the money. He was the keeper of the money bag, and he took money out of the bag when no one was looking, and he spent the money on himself. Now leave her alone, said Jesus. She gave this perfume to me as a gift because I will not always be able to be here with you. So, what did Mary, what did Mary give to Jesus? that was so special to him? What did she give him? Chocolates? A hundred dollars? What did she give him? What lost? <laughs> I didn't hear that one. Foot wash. It was a kind of a foot wash. What did she wash his feet with? What did she use? An expensive perfume. Expensive perfume. She didn't just use soap and water, but what did that mean when she used that perfume on Jesus? What did that mean? She loved him. If only Jesus knew how much we loved him. Yeah? And so that was probably the most precious thing she owned. It cost a lot of money. She probably had no other way of getting that back again. But she showed that love to him. And I think that mattered way more to Jesus than if she had sold it and given the money because it showed Jesus that Mary loved him, that she was, he was her Lord and Master. And so sometimes all the things that we could do or the things that we could give don't matter near as much to Jesus. Who thinks they're busy Busy doing church things or God things. Ah, you better, you should have nodded yes. Might do some shoulder tapping. There's heaps of jobs to do. Right? But of all the things you do, what matters even more to Jesus is that we show our love to him. Yeah? And if you can learn that when you were kids, when you're little, you can show Jesus that you love him 
that will matter so much to him. Yeah? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your love for us and for the example here with Mary, how she poured out her love like she poured out that perfume. Help us to be people who love you. Help us to be people that aren't ashamed of that, but with such a precious thing that we can share this love with you. Bless these little ones, Lord, as they grow. Let that be a value in their lives, that you matter to them. Amen. Father God, thank you for your presence. Thank you that you want to come and be with your people and presence yourself with us. Holy Spirit, we invite you here again. We will, You are welcome in this place. We do ask that your breath would come from heaven, that you would fill our hearts with your life. Holy Spirit, we make ourselves available. We open ourselves to you, that we would meet with you in a new way today and that um, you would fill us afresh so that we can go out from here in your love, in your Holy Spirit power and carry the blessings that you give us. Lord, such precious, precious things. And so would you stand and let's, um, let's join together. You are the one at the beginning, one with God, Lord, most high. You hid in glory in creation, now revealed in you, Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name.
Nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is.
There must be more than this. Oh, breath of God, come breathe in me. There must be more than this. Spirit of God, we wait for you. Fill us anew. And you we pray, consuming fire, burn into the flame, a passion for your name, Spirit of God, born in this place, Lord have your way, Lord have your way. Is it a fresh filling? Is it more love? Is it more of his peace? Ask for him. He's a good God. He will give it to you. Fill us new, Lord. Love abounding. Fresh spirit. Fill us new.
The Lord is a consuming fire. He comes to burn the chaff away, the sin out of, out of our lives. He's calling us to be a pure people. He wants us to come to Him. As we reach out to Him, He will purify us by His consuming fire. His Word speaks. It brings truth. It brings life, it brings healing, it brings our future, our destiny. raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Mm. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. I just get that, um, before Mary did the kids talk, I'd just been thinking about Mary and the, the um, ointment, and, and just that sense of her free freedom to worship, mm. and just that song about breaking the chains to set us free to worship, I feel like God wants to just dissolve some chains with his love and you know we don't have to be self-conscious um, that our love for him would overtake our um, res reserve I suppose yeah just feel like he really just wants to free us free us to worship mm. in a new way Amen. Oh 
pray to the Lord in response to his words. chapter 2 verses 1 to 7 and it's on page 1202 in your pew bible to the angel of the church in Ephesus write these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands I know your deeds your hard work and your perseverance I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favour. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. Thank you, God, for your word. And draw us deeper, Lord. Let your light shine on it. Help us see and hear in Jesus' name. John was told to write to the angels of the seven churches. As we work through these letters, uh, let's prayerfully imagine what he would have written to us. There might be corrections, there might be some commendations. There's a lot here and we're not going to hit on all of it today, but I want to start with this. Jesus commends the Ephesian church for their work. Jesus notices when we endure troubles and hardship because we believe in him. When we're faithful, when it's difficult, he notices that. He knows when his work matters so much to us. And he notices even when, for us, it is a chore. He sees. One day when we each get to stand in front of him, we'd probably all be hoping to hear, Well done, good and faithful servant. 
And it, what, a, what, a, what a relief that will be. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. It was a pleasure, really. <laughs> be so nice to hear that. But we need to be assured, as the passage here uh, reminds us, none of what we do escapes his attention. You know, at your house you probably only have one TV, at the most two TVs going at the same time. We can't comprehend it all, but Jesus, it's like he can see all our lives all the time. And he knows what we do for him. The church at Ephesus picked out fake apostles. He commends their discernment. Now, this is important for us because historically, denominations like Presbyterian, which some of us might claim to have a heritage there, for, for, for those in that kind of situation, there were no other apostles. God got this church started with those 12 original disciples, and then we got the scriptures and there was no more need for apostles. That's been the attitude. But God is still sending apostles. That didn't stop with the original 12. Actually, when you think about it, there's only 11 because you've got to take Judas out. And then there was Matthias who was appointed to replace him. And then after that, Paul came along, and none of us would say Paul wasn't an apostle. So if there are only ever supposed to be 12, how come we're up to 14 already? And what would have been so special about picking false apostles if all they needed to do was know their name? They knew their original 12, you know, Peter, James, John, Andrew. What's your name? Henry. Well, you're obviously not an apostle. It was a bit more complicated than that. God was still sending apostles. But we need to pick, they needed to pick, and he commends them for picking those that weren't. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13 is a well-known passage in that it, talks about how Jesus gives to the church some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. And he's given each of these roles a special part to play in the building up of his church. I don't know if you've noticed, but he hasn't finished with his church yet. Now, key role for the apostle, just feels like I'm rushing here. There's, hopefully the right things will stick. Yes, hope the right things will stick. A key role for the apostle was to establish churches. There are plenty of places around the world where that needs to happen, and there are places where the church has been but is no longer alive. Something needs to be rebirthed. Paul was an apostle commissioned to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Peter was sent to the religious Jews. Each reflected a different flavor of the same thing. Both were apostles, different kind of role, different people group. The trouble is, when you've got anything good happening, there nearly always comes along a counterfeit, a fake, because there's money to be made or fame to be had or something else to be had when you can ride on the coattails of someone else or something else that's doing really well. So when God births these ministries in the church through the world, we should not be surprised that there are others that come along wanting to ride on the back of that or even 
inspired by the evil one because they've got nastier intentions. Like the Ephesians, we have to know that Jesus is still sending, but we have to know too who are the good ones and who are the fake ones. It's really good for a church to have people who can work together, those who have a knowledge of the word, those who have a deep appreciation of the character of God, those with good spiritual sniffers that can, mm, something's not right here. Right? God's given all of us spiritual antenna. They're supposed to be up going, beep, beep, beep. You're listening to me, what I'm saying. You're listening to what happens on the news. You're discerning all the time. God, is this your kingdom or is this something else? We've got to be awake. We, Louise and I talk nearly every time we sit down and watch five minutes of news. Is this really true? Is this real? I think that's just, we're learning over and over again, discerning, discerning, discerning. But it's harder when someone says, well, Jesus said and God said and the Bible says that doesn't make them in the right place. So let's have two or three things. What, what would make a fake or a false apostle? Pride. Good one. And the fun, fun, I'll interrupt. The funny thing about pride is the the owner of that pride cannot see it. Everyone else can. We're going to come to that. Excellent point. Excellent point. Something else. A fake apostle. What's well, a good thing we're having this talk, isn't it? Come on, last chance. Ego. Ego, kind of connected with the pride, yes? All right. First thing, wrong gospel, fake apostle. So important. When, we, when our grasp of the gospel is weak, when we don't know how precious it is, any Tom, Dick, or Harry, or Sarah, Millie, J can come in and say, well, this is the... We don't know. We have to know the gospel, what that's about. There's a huge temptation, as was revealed in other parts of the New Testament, to try and add something to the finished work of Jesus Christ. Right? What Jesus did... That's stuck in history, that happened, that's what God has done that, and the, the impact of that rolls through to us. His life, his death, his resurrection, the outpouring of his spirit, nothing's going to change that, but we have to know it. Paul had problems uh, with others who he, he kind of calls super apostles, he probably had his nose slightly out of joint or his tongue in his cheek or something to call them super apostles but they were ones who were insisting the new Gentile believers had to live under the Jewish law because to them it can't be as simple as what hangs on Jesus surely you have to do something else to be right with God that's adding to the gospel Paul says no they're false they're not bearers of the true gospel, they're bearers of something else. Now, signs and wonders, healing, that is evidence of apostleship, but not proof of, because just like we can have healing from Jesus, there can be fake healing as well. fake stuff that is designed to take away 
from Jesus' glory and in particular to snap all people away, catch them up in false teaching and just mess their lives. John's point. Apostles are sent. That's part of the meaning of the word. They're sent. The issue is, who sent them? God, yes, God sends apostles to be apostles. And I think it's best when the church recognizes God's grace on that individual or that team, like they did with Barnabas and Paul, when the church at Antioch said, uh, the Spirit of God said, set apart these two, I've got a special job for them. The church recognized the grace of God on those men. Now, the, one of the biggest problems with apostles today, well, they think, this is a pretty good deal. Look at the attention you get. And they send themselves. Fake apostles who don't understand what it means to be part of the church cannot be expected to build the church of Jesus up. It's not uncommon to find people who are very confident in their own spirituality. They're sure that Jesus has called them not in relationship with anybody else. They're a law unto themselves. Does not the Bible say, all authority in heaven and, Jesus speaking, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. All authority on heaven and earth belongs to Jesus. That's another way of saying anybody, particularly those in any kind of leadership, need to know they are under some kind of authority accountability. I am. In the Presbyterian system, the presbytery is my boss. I get the privilege of working with you. But if they were thought, Murray, you're doing more damage than good. Bye-bye. I'm accountable. They have the power to hire and fire. They mostly would want to see me do well and see the work prosper. But if you're in any kind of leadership, you need to know who your boss is because you're not the boss. He's the boss. So someone who, who might look like an apostle but is accountable to no one, bye. Key tool for discernment. Another sign of a fake apostle are those who think they're sent to rule over the church, not build it up. To rule over, not build up. The Nicolaitans are mentioned in the letter to the Ephesians and also to the ones in Pergamon. Now, scholars have debated what was wrong with the Nicolaitans. And some have suggested, oh, they're into some kind of immorality or idolatry or greed or whatever else. But they're only mentioned twice in Revelation, and there's not a lot of agreement about what their problem was. The clue may well be in the name they were given. Nico means to rule over and the Latians, laity is the ordinary people in the church. So the problem could well be here. Those that were domineering or perhaps had elected themselves to a um, special kind of priesthood in the church, bad sign. Why would that be offensive to Jesus? He's the head of the he is the head of the church. Anything else? Why would Jesus be concerned about his people in that environment? Could easily be led astray. He 
he's not designed us to be under each other in a, an oppressive sense. We are children, we are family, we have one Lord. So those in leadership, their job is to build the others up, not to boss the others down. Another really important key, picking good from false. I would favor that interpretation because that fits with the, the whole thing about discerning true apostles. And maybe the way John was instructed to write, those two aspects go together. But, you know, Holy Spirit reveals otherwise, I'm happy to stand down. So, Jesus commended the Ephesian church for their perseverance under hardship and their, their hard work, their faithfulness. He commended their discernment, well done for picking the good from the false. But he said, there is one thing I have against you. You've forsaken your first love. What was it like when you first came to believe? Did anybody have a sense of excitement? Joy? Oh, wonder of wonders. This is glorious, believing in Jesus. And not unlike, you know, falling in love with the, with the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with, the Tweety Birds go and the stars twinkle, don't they? Yeah? It's glorious, that first love. And it doesn't matter who knows. You know, she's in love with me and I'm in love with her. I don't care if the world knows. But sometimes something happens along the way in our Christian walk. It's like, well, you know, I love the Lord, but, you know, I don't want to impose that on anybody. We get quieter and quieter. Another thing about with this first love, it's so easy to pray and worship. I'm enjoying where we seem to be uh, going with our worship. I would want for all of us to know when we come here, it's the easiest thing to pour out our love to him. Some of us, our worship and our love, it's like in a can. Somebody needs to come along and open the can, pour his love out, take the top off the bottle, pour the ointment out. But when our love grows cold or we've fallen from our first love, with it, no, I'll keep this oil for another day. I'll keep the can closed up for now. Or when this, this love for Jesus was brand new, there was peace that came. The priorities in our life seem to be all rearranged and things don't bother me the same. Still got issues going on in my life, but there's peace there that wasn't there before. Are we talking to anybody today? Jesus wanted the church at Ephesus to come back to their first love. It wasn't like it was strange. They knew where they had come from. but they could not be a witness for him without it. Doesn't matter how hard we work if our love for him has dried up. He warns them, I'll have to take your lampstand away. The church who has fallen out of love with Jesus cannot be an effective witness for him. We know that Jesus sees all the work we do for him, but it can be a real trap for church people especially. We think we work so hard for him. 
But, you know, working hard for him does not make us love him. It's loving him that makes us work hard for him. Helps us be faithful. Inspires us to be diligent. That helps us go the extra mile. It's because we love him. It's an old phrase. We don't want to get so caught up with the work of the Lord that we forget the Lord of the work. Working hard for Jesus will not make you love him more. But loving him is the very best motivation for serving him. When we know how much he's poured out into our lives, Lord, I've I've just got to thank you. I've just got to praise you. You, you, You're the reason I'm here. That's the best equipment. That's the best petrol. That's the best motivation to serve him. So this is your homework for the week. I would like for you to, to prayerfully ponder, spend a bit of time on this. For me, for you, what is the closest to the heart of things for me? Serving God or loving him? That's easy to take away, isn't it? Serving him or loving him? Amen. Dear Jesus, Lord, that was just um, great to be in your presence this morning. And Lord, hear your word. Lord, you are our first love. Let us not depart from it, Lord. And as Murray said, as we go this week, search our hearts, Lord, as we we know that you love us, Lord, and we do work for you, Lord, but let us find that first love in you again if it is starting to wane or that it needs refreshing, Lord. Lord, we know that your consuming fire will, will burn out the chaff, Lord, but we have to put ourselves into into your hands, Lord, for that to happen. Well, Father God, we just um, bless these tithes, these offerings, these gifts, Lord. Lord, we give them to you because, Lord, we love you. And Lord, we want these gifts to be used wisely to build your kingdom here. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you go with each one this week. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Our benediction today is may the grace. forevermore forevermore